This is the first in a series of lectures on PET-CT. We're going to start with the biophysics of positron emission tomography. So what's a positron? A positron is like an electron, but it has a positive charge instead of a negative charge. In other words, it's the antimatter counterpart of the electron. Oh, antimatter, are you some sort of Star Trek fanatic? Well, yes, yes, but, but antimatter is real, and I use it every day at work, not in quantities necessary to power a starship, but I, I do use it every day. One way that a positron is created is by the decay of a nucleus that is neutron poor, that it, is, it doesn't have enough neutrons relative to its protons. An example of this is fluorine-18. Fluorine should have 19 atomic weight to be stable. If there's only 18, if it's shy one neutron in the nucleus, it's unstable. And an important thing to understand is when a positron and an electron collide, they annihilate one another. Matter and antimatter annihilate one another in an explosion. So here's our 18 fluorine molecule going about its everyday life, but it's unstable. And every couple of hours, about half of these atoms will degrade. When they degrade, it turns into 18 oxygen and emits a positron. That's this beta positive right here. That's a positron. The positron just wanders off and it travels for about a millimeter when it encounters an electron. The positron and the electron annihilate one another and there's an explosion. It's a very small explosion uh, relative to a human being, a very large explosion relative to an electron. This explosion creates a tremendous amount of energy, E equals mc squared, and that energy is dispersed as two photons that shoot off in completely opposite directions. What we're detecting in positron emission tomography is actually those two photons that are going simultaneously at high energy in two opposite directions, completely 180 degrees from one another. So fluorine-18 has a half-life of about two hours. Uh, it's convenient because that's a relatively long half-life as unstable atoms go. Uh, fluorine-18 can be substituted into bioactive compounds like glucose or thymidine. The most famous example is, of course, 18F-fluorodeoxyglucose. Now, fluorodeoxyglucose acts a lot like glucose when you inject it into the body. It enters cells the same way that glucose enters cells, but it doesn't get metabolized by the cells. It just accumulates in cells that are glucose hungry. So it is even more effective than gluco normal glucose would be at identifying those cells. Another very important thing to understand about positron annihilation is the concept of attenuation correction. If these high energy photons are produced in a place where they are surrounded by air and there's not much to absorb, absorb them, they will be overemphasized in the resulting image. For example, if it is produced in the skin right next to the sur air surrounding the patient, it will be artificially inflated. Similarly, if it's produced in the lungs where it's predominantly surrounded by air, the signal will be artificially inflated. So we need to correct for the attenuation of these high energy photon by dense materials like bones. And then you get a more familiar picture from PET-CT. There's more than one way to correct attenuation. When we only had PET, we used to do an extra transmission scan to figure out how dense the body was at different parts. Once we started using combined PET-CT, we could use the CT data to correct for different densities within the body. It turns out CT is a really good approximation for the attenuation that these high energy photons undergo, so we can use the CT for our mathematical models. Now, attenuation correction is very useful, but it also produces artifacts that you have to be aware of and not 
fall into these traps. For example, here's a PET CT where you can see very focal uptake in the mediastinum uh, just below the carina. But this is an artifact. It's produced by the uh, calcium in this subcarinal node. When we look back at the non-attenuation corrected images, we can see that there really is no superphysiologic uptake in that vicinity. Um, this is why it's really important to always have the non-attenuation correction images available to you, even as you're interpreting the attenuation correction images. Here's another example of the same problem. This is a patient where the PET strongly suggests that something's going on around the shoulder. But when we look at the CT, we can see that this is really an artifact of undilute contrast that has been injected into this arm. Right? This is momentary contrast. By the time we actually do the imaging for the PET CT, this is going to have washed away. And you can see that once this has been repeated, this PET image has been repeated without all that contrast in the way, there really is nothing going on there. It's, it's a false positive. So attenuation correction, extremely important, but it has artifacts of its own that it can potentially introduce. Don't fall for that. This concludes the introductory lecture on the biophysics of PET-CT. And we'll move on next to protocols for optimizing PET-CT.